My name is Jerry, I'm from Wild Eye, and this is the first video in which I'm going to be answering your wildlife photography questions. Anything goes, from the travel side, gear, post-processing, in the field, craft, anything to do with wildlife photography, I'm going to try and answer for you. Where this came from is, on some of the safaris and courses that we run, obviously there's a lot of questions that come up, but that started spilling over into social. People sending us emails, asking questions about where to go to see lions, how to photograph leopards at sunset, whatever the case might be. And um, this then also went on to Instagram, Twitter, and all these places where we find ourselves. So this idea was born. A couple of days ago, I put out a request for some questions that I can get this whole thing going. And you guys came to the party beautifully. Some awesome questions, exactly what I was looking for. And I'm hoping this is going to add some value to your photography. So, like I said, this is the first episode. Let's see where this goes. I'm going to try and get through all the questions you guys have sent. Instagram, email, Facebook, Twitter, wherever you've asked your questions, I'm going to try and deal with them in the next couple of episodes of this series. Let's get right into it. Yoda0907 asked on Instagram, what gear do you use? Is it your dream job? Gear. Right. The only camera that I own, personally, is this. It's my iPhone. Um, you see, when I choose gear, I'll discuss that now, when I, when I choose my gear for a destination, I think of a couple of things. Number one, what are the types of images I want to create? Where is the destination, i.e. how close can I get to animals? Um, East Africa and polar bears, for example, require bigger glass than something like the Sabi Sands, where you get closer to your animals. So the choice of gear for any specific trip for me is very different. It depends on type of images, uh, like I said, the destination, how close you can get, the only gear I think, the only piece of gear that I always, always take is a 70 to 200 mil. I can use that anything from portraits to kind of more landscape type images depending on the situation, but that is the only lens that goes in my bag every single time. Other than that, it's very determined by pff, sure, where I'm shooting, what I'm shooting, but for me as well, which is slightly different I think to for most of you guys is we have a rental database at Wild Eye where all of, that's why I don't have gear, all of my gear went in there, yeah? So when I'm heading out on a trip on a safari, I will go and see and have a look at what most people on the trip are using, Nikon or Canon, whatever else, and I will choose my gear based on that so that I can add value in the field. Historically, I shot Nikon. Uh, it was the cheapest DSLR at the time when I bought in Gibraltar, of all places, and um, the, you kind of get stuck into the system. You learn the menus, you get uh, lenses, flashes, whatever. But as time progressed and I started having to do courses and lecturing, I needed to learn the Canon system as well. I know both of them backwards now. So when I go on a trip, I will see what most of my clients are using and I will take. Sometimes I shoot both Nikon and Canon on a trip. See, it's not about my photography when I go on safari with people. But gear-wise, the only thing I will always take, 70 to 200, that I use all the time, all the time. Is it a dream job? Now, I'm assuming, Yoda, that this is because of uh, the images you see. Yes, I think it is, but it is still a job. You see, people see the romantic side of what we do. They see us out in the field, taking great images, posting these things, all these wonderful things, but there's the back end of it. There's the admin, the planning, the costing sheets, the logistics, everything that still makes this a business. So. Is it a job? Yes, it is. Is it a dream job? <laughs> I think it's damn close. Asked on email. Just wondered if you had any advice as to how to get into the wildlife photo photography guiding industry and the best way to go about getting a job as a wildlife photographer. Lewis, this is a phenomenal question. Thank you. It's something we speak about in the office on a very regular basis. What does it take to become a wildlife photographic guide, I think the most important thing, I'm going to say it again, the most important thing is that you respect the industry. I think, no, I don't think, I know there are a lot of people out there who have no background and no education in photography, in hospitality, in guiding. All of those things are imperative. It is absolutely imperative for you to create a product which will add value to people's experience. Does that make sense? There are people who are studio photographers or landscape can still fly, or they do, I don't know, cityscape, street photography. Then because of the romance thereof, the romantic notion of going out and photographing animals all day long, they start photographic safaris. They have, that's not respecting the industry. 
And I strongly, I spoke to Marlon earlier on. There's a reason, mentioning Marlon, there's a reason why Marlon is one of the most sought after photographic guides. And that is why he's a part of our team. He's paid his dues, he's done the education, he's got the experience, and he's very good at teaching people. So I'm still getting to your question, but I think the most important thing is respecting the industry. You are dealing with people's, I mean, you can mess around with people's money on, I don't know, cars, cell phones, glasses, whatever. But a photographic safari is a treat for people. That is, that is where they go on holiday. You need to respect that and you need not to mess around with it. So, what do you need to do? Make sure you're qualified. Now, I see, Lewis, from your email, you have got the Fagasa qualifications. Field Guide Association of South Africa, phenomenal. Great start. That's better than most already. Now it's going to be getting in touch with people, talking to people, showing them the work, showing them your passion for their photography. You see, there's a lot of different things together here. At the end of the day, it's all of that and it's the hustle. It is getting down and grinding every single day, getting in touch with people and making them see that you actually care. See, I think the reason, and I said, why Marlon is as respected as he is as a photographic guide and the f why I get the feedback I get from my trips and the same with Andrew and the guys is it's not about us. We respect the industry. I'm going to say it again. We respect the industry, the photographic safari industry, and it's about the people's experience. So how to get in? <laughs> All of that. There's a lot of, almost a rant. No, not yet. Um, respect the industry. Pay your dues and make a difference to people. Engage with people at a level that they will understand and build their experiences from there. Second part, you mentioned a job as a wildlife photographer. I think the first and most important thing is for us to define what that really is. I can't think of very many, if any, wildlife photographers like in the old days who go out and exploring and just taking pictures. Almost all of us, all of them, have to do things on the side sell books, sell prints, do lectures, do safaris, whatever the case is, in order to sustain that job as a wildlife photographer. Is it still possible? Eesh. I think if you have a huge trust fund and you don't need the cash to sustain it, maybe. But um, I think as a wildlife photographer, you can niche yourself in many ways. You can become a specialist fine art wildlife print photographer. You can become a fine art, docu or cancel fine art. You can become a wildlife photography documentary, and you can specialize in certain niches. It's just the wildlife photography genre is just so huge. But there, there you can make up your own thing. You decide what you want to be as a wildlife photographer, and you go from there. It's the definition of the, of the, of the position, I think, first. But there it is. I mean, it's deciding what you're passionate about and driving that. Ruby H. Howe asked on Instagram, how do you hide your presence from the animals? Do you find their behavior changes because they can see or sense you? Ruby, another great question, and I think something that a lot of photographers, especially newer, and not always, and some professionals make a mistake with, is they influence the animal's behavior. I think at that point, I think every single animal that you photograph will know that you're there. Yes, you are gonna have a situation where they are far off and you're using big glass, big lenses, and you can photograph them without them knowing about you. But these animal senses are so attuned to nature, they are so much more, 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 more switched on than we are out there, that they hear us miles off, they smell us miles off. So the most important thing is you can approach these animals slowly, set up and then wait, and allow them then to go back to natural behavior and do what they do. The moment you influence an animal out in the field to get an image, you have failed. You have, again, you've disrespected the industry. Um, it's, 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 they're going to know that you're there. With, I mean, you approach on a vehicle, you're crashing through branches, you've got diesel fumes, people talking, whatever. They're going to know that you are there. But for me, it comes back. That's not the important thing. If they're aware of us, that's cool. But don't influence the behavior. What pisses me off to no end is people now using drones and remote control vehicles to get closer. They can get closer to the animal safely. And apparently, because there's no human involved, the animals won't react. It's rubbish. We see it all the time on Facebook. People post these amazing, uh, amazing, yeah, images on Facebook and it gets 5,000 shares. People saying, oh, this is great, incredible image, wonderful, 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 but it's of a stressed animal. They drove that thing or they flew that thing so close to the animal, it had to pull back. You've come into its fight flight zone. It had to pull back and snarl at this device. You take a picture and now it's amazing. No. You have changed the animal's behavior. 
You have influenced something which shouldn't have happened in order to get the shot. Now, fine, from a wildlife photography point of view, that is ethically just wrong. It should not be happening. But back it up a touch. Breathe. Um, yes, animals will know that we're there, and it's up to us then to keep it natural as possible. Second part of your question you did ask is, uh, can we see behavior changing? Absolutely. If you get too close, animals, and you get inside their, their personal zone, animals will either fight or flight, yeah? They're gonna attack you or they're gonna run away. You will see it immediately. And on our safaris, when I head out into the field, and a lot of the better and ethical wildlife photographers out there will never cross that line. C Love Snap asked on Instagram, which software do you use to upload crop photos to Instagram? Also, how does a wildlife photographer build a good following on social media? I love this Instagram handle, Sea Love Snaps, photography to a T. Nice one. Question, Instagram, very simple. Instagram is a one-to-one -one ratio crop, so it's a square, yeah? When you upload directly into Instagram, you can zoom in and out, but it'll keep the crop as a square, so you cannot always post portraits or landscape images. So the composition you can refine by moving that image around on your phone and then placing it from there. Worrying about quality when cropping, I don't think should be an issue. Uh, well, it shouldn't be because even on an iPhone or a DSLR, if that's what you're using, you shouldn't be cropping in that much. If you have to crop in that much to make the image better to the point where you're losing quality, don't post the image. It's probably not good enough. Rather make sure you get it right in camera or in phone and then you can crop it from there. I personally use Snapseed, phenomenal app for the iPhone, where I do my crop as a one-to-one, -one, so I fine-tune my composition and things there, and then I can also do all my other adjustments. It's very, very Lightroom-esque, kind of for iPhone, wonderful app, and then I post into Instagram. What I have done recently as well, if you're following my Instagram feed, is you'll see I posted images with white borders, either on the side or top and bottom. It's an app called InstaSize, which you can use to post full landscape or full portrait images and it just fills up the sides with white. So it's kind of like a fine art look, if you will. A lot of fine art floating around. Different day. Um, but nice way to post the full images without having to crop. Give it a bash. Check out my feed. You'll see some of those. And have a look. It's a nice way to mix up what you're posting on Instagram. Last part of the question, and I'm going to leave it here for today on this one. How to build a decent social media following. This is the case. Now, important thing. Two things. Don't buy your followers, and number two, numbers don't mean shit. It means nothing, right? You're gonna gain followers and real followers online that care about your work the same way you will as if you're gonna do it in real life. Talk about your images, show people your images, and share your passion for your images. Basically, just be a nice person as well, because that helps. On that, I still don't get how some people, wildlife photographers trying to push out, they create a wildlife photography or a photography page, and they've got their personal page. On the photography page, it's all, I don't know, clouds, rainbows, ponies, nice images, everything's pretty, but on their own page, they swear it's fuck this guy and shit this, and, and then they just mess it up on a personal brand point of view. You have to put out, everything you put out online defines you as a brand. So as you as a wildlife photographer, if you want to build a brand, be real, be authentic, share images that you care about, and let people see how much you care about your work. Consistency, very important. Post on a regular basis. Engagement, probably even more so. Answer people, if they ask you questions, get back to them, answer their questions, go and, if they ask for advice, help them. Break it down, online people are looking for two things. Education or entertainment. You could pretty much break it down into that, yes? Education, if someone wants to learn something and they want to learn something about wildlife photography, you've put yourself out as a wildlife photographer, they might look at you for some information. Give it to them. Share images where you share the background info, the EXIF info, how you took it, where you went, what time of year. Teach people something. On the entertainment side of it, it sounds strange, but there are people out there, somewhere in the world, sitting at a desk now, at work, using the office internet to look for images to take their mind away from the shitty desk job that they have. Yeah, it's real, come on, admit. So, your entertainment value is giving them images that takes them away into a place they would rather be. Share those images with them and share it regularly. Share great images, put it out there. Don't worry what people say, don't worry about the numbers and then share more. That's all you have to do. Entertain people with your images and educate them with the background information on your images. And again, 
authentic, be real, and keep on doing it on a regular basis. Eventually, you will get the numbers. People will start caring about your work. Again, I would rather have 10 people following my work and caring about it than have 200,000 who just like, 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 or write comments like, wow, awesome shot, great. Means nothing. Be real, share your passion, and people will follow you eventually, guaranteed. Right, some cool questions for today. Um, nice things coming up tomorrow. Being charged by lions, some lens and gear recommendations, and also then how to pick a winner out of your own shots or other people's images. Right, if you want to ask your questions, let's discuss, let's change the way we discuss wildlife photography. Ask your questions on the Wildlife Facebook page, my Facebook page, my Instagram, my Twitter, or email me. I'll put everything at the end of this video. Email them to me, and I will try and answer them. If I can't answer them, I'll pull some of the guys in from the office, and they will also help to do that. You keep asking your questions, and I'm going to try, through all of us that we have at WildEye, to answer them for you. Yes? My name is Jerry. I'm from WildEye. I will see you next time.